And welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com, available on iTunes and Pacifica Radio and Progressive Radio Network and at opednews.com slash podcasts and on YouTube. Uh, my guest to, for this show is Marilyn Preston. She's a journalist, a healthy lifestyle expert, the Emmy Award winning TV producer. Uh, she's the author of Energy Express, America's longest running syndicated fitness column. Her latest book is All's Well. Marilyn's also a certified fitness trainer, certified well coach and coach and founding chair of Girls in the Game, a nonprofit which helps girls get the healthy lifestyle training they need to become strong, confident women. Her website is MarilynPreston.com. That's M-A-R-I-L-Y-N-N -N, Preston, P-R-E-S-T-O-N.com. And Girls in the Game is girlsinthegame.com. You can also check out her free columns at creators.com, which is her syndicator. Great to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Rob. Great to be here. Yeah. So I invited you on based on the idea that the show is about bottom up. You know, basically, the idea of the show, if you're new to the show and just hearing it for the first time, is I believe we're transitioning from a primarily top down culture, business world, personal way. And we're shifting to one that's more bottom up. Bottom up tends to be more uh, connected to people, more interdependent, more cooperative, more caring. And uh, it's a huge change. It's a change that has started about 20 years ago and it's exploding. And the reason it's exploding is because we humans evolved to be bottom up. And so we have literally hundreds of different neurobiological genes that program us to function in a bottom-up way. Civilization came along, repressed a lot of them. The internet came along and it catalyzed them to start waking up again. So here we are in a newly bottom-up world. Yes. And so what I do is I talk to people who have a take on bottom-up. Okay. And uh, you've got a great take on bottom-up from a health approach. So tell us about your book. The book is All's Well. The, the art and science of personal well-being. That's, that's the part that emphasizes caring and cooperative, as you said, so important to our well-being, to give us that sense of well-being. People, we care for others, they care for us. Yes. So how is health bottom-up? Talk to us about how your book brings bottom-up approaches to health. Okay, Rob, thanks. So this is a book about personal well-being. So it's not a diet book. It's not a book about getting tighter buns. You know, and personal well-being is very, very personal. So it's not about how much you weigh or how many crunches you can do. It is this feeling of personal well-being. And that, is a, that comes from the bottom up. It won't come to you from the top down from the government. We can look at our healthcare systems right now. They're so, it is so broken. It is so not caring. It is so not compassionate at the, it's so chaotic at the moment that it gives us an opportunity to wake up, as you said, and see that, you know, really we, we have to take care of ourselves. We need the, to participate in the system of medical care, but we have to be very smart consumers of it. And the, what your book does, you, get, you know, you, t you just said you have to participate in, in the healthcare system, but your book is primarily about things that have nothing to do with the healthcare system. They're about living your life and ha developing ways of living, ways of relating that are n not involved with the healthcare system at all. They're about how to live yes. so that you can be healthy and have a sense of well being because health is more than just not coughing. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. And, and yet we are, the first thing we think of if we get sick or our child gets sick is, okay, call the doctor. And then in a minute, you're in the healthcare system. So it is, there are those times we must depend on it, but there's so much that we can do to stay out of the doctor's office, out of the hospital. Uh, prevention is such a big deal. And I know you like to talk politics. It, only four cents, you, you, four cents of every healthcare dollar, only four cents goes to prevention and patient education. 
So um, we very quickly learn from that that it's up to us to b take better health uh, care, take better care of ourselves. And it's simple I wanna, stuff. Go ahead. I want to I want to point out two things. One, thinking in terms of I need to go to the doctor and get fixed. That's really a top-down way of thinking about your health. It's like yes. it's depending on an authoritarian to get help right and if it worked if it was working bravo but you know what we have as you well know the most expensive healthcare system delivering the most mediocre health care according to uh, world health organizations and and many many studies and so <laughs> and so many millions of people who are uncovered and that is cruel that is just a cruel thing and you know, i i spent some time overseas in Greece. And so, so I'm lucky enough to have good friends who live in, in London, who live in Sweden, who live in Italy, who live in France, who live in Greece, etc. And you know what? None of them are worried about going to the doctor or, or paying for health care because their government knows it's, a, it's their right. So in every other civilized nation, they're getting the health care they need. But in America, we are in a chaotic situation, and maybe it is shifting toward the light. I hope so. But that makes it all the more important that we use our uh, <coughs> grassroots resources to yes. uh, take care of ourselves and prevent uh, ourselves from getting sick. You know, one thing that's interesting, you mentioned that about 4 or 5% of health care is devoted to prevention. Uh, it, that's about the same percentage that's uh, devoted to diplomacy compared to what we spend on war in the military. Yeah. In, yes. in some ways, they're very similar. You know, cause it, both it's a bit turned upside down, but we can't wait for the system to change. I mean, I think that we are at a point where the system is shifting in, in a dramatic way. But in the meantime, we look to our own resources, meaning, you know, going from a sedentary lifestyle to a little more activity in our day. Eating real food, this is a cause that Michael Pollan, great journalist, has, has popularized. I carry that message in the book, for sure. Eat real food. Um, in the 40, 50 years that we've had processed foods dominating the American diet, and I've been tracking this as a journalist for 40 years, obesity has skyrocketed, all kinds of digestive problems, all sorts of diseases and ailments. And the additives and chemicals and other unwanted, unknown substances in these processed foods making us sick. They're making us sick. So, And when you talk about healthy foods and processed foods, again, these are, you're talking about a, a system, a food system that, that is very top down. You've got a handful of giant big agri companies doing monoculture, using uh, Monsanto's Roundup and GMO agriculture, which they're trying to inflict upon the entire world so there's no other choice. They and are doing that. That is going on at the top. But let me tell you some good news about what's going on at the bottom. Yeah. So I'm just in uh, the north woods of Wisconsin, a red part of a red state, a part of the world I just adore and love. So I go to the local health food store. So this is a red state. They like their brats, their brewskis, and, and the health food store has tripled in size. The farmer's markets, they're standing in line for products that are locally grown, sustainably grown, many of them organic. Um, they are shopping in a store now that carries non-toxic cleaning supplies less toxic, let's say, cosmetics. So it, 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 that is the bottom-up movement. This is some, this feeling, I, well, I asked a good friend of mine who's lived up there for years, I said, John, so what's going on here? It's wonderful. I see all these Pilates centers, yoga, fitness, people are out there. He said, Marilyn, people, up, even up here, people are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And they're connecting the dots for themselves. And of course, all this food is readily available and it's cheaper. But the bottom up is smart, is getting smarter. And I think they're making healthier choices. I do see that. 
And I, I think it's, uh, it's very encouraging for, you know, all parties talk about the country coming together. Well, personal well-being, health, is such, is such a wonderful common ground. To come, to, get, to come together, because everyone wants it. I don't care what your political persuasion is. No one wants to be sick, and, kids want, and they want their kids to be healthy. They want to be healthy, and they don't want to go broke in the process. Absolutely. So you also talk about connection and how that plays a role in health. I'm, I'm sorry, say a con connection. About connection, about the importance of people have being in relationships. Yes, thank you. Um, absolutely. It's, it's so interesting because people kind of have a sense that, oh, you know, I should, act, I've, to live longer, I should, I should exercise. I should eat well. And these, it's true. But the, the research has shown over and over again that just as important as those items are your social relationships, your real friendships, who you love, who loves you. There, there's very interesting research out of, um, on the blue zones. Blue zones, and people, your listeners can find it at bluezones.com. Uh, Dan Butner is the head researcher there, and they've looked at communities where all over the world where people are, live very long and vigorous lives without dementia. So they go into their 90s, you know, fully engaged and boom, they're gone. And, and this is what one of their big findings is, yes, they, they move around more. And, and yes, they eat real greens and drink some good wine, but they are connected every day to the people of their community. And it's hugely important to their well-being. So that kind of connection and also connection to community health centers. I mean, we, uh, that it, just to go to a, a place in your community where someone cares about you and will listen to you, not just spend the usual seven seconds and write you a prescription, but listen to you. This is, this is a very important. I'm all for community, the growth of community health centers. Okay. So you're listening to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com. You can access it on Pacifica Radio, Progressive Radio Network, at iTunes, at opednews.com slash podcasts, and uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, my guest is Marilyn Preston. She's a journalist, healthy lifestyle expert, Emmy Award winning TV producer, the author of Energy Express, America's longest running syndicated fitness column, and uh, she's the author of a new book, All Is Well. The Art and Science of Personal Well-Being. And we're talking about how there are a lot of bottom-up aspects to health. So you, you, you talk about how one of the problems of this system, this healthcare system that we have, is it kills people. Iatrogenic illness. And, and you, 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 it's the third leading cause of death. That... Um, errors, mistakes by doctors and hospitals, and this is research that's come out within the last year, um, yes, is considered is the third leading cause of death in, in, in the U.S., um, which is all the more reason to uh, stay healthy and, and, and partner up with your doctor and make, you know, and so that they see you as an individual and pay attention to you. And it's also a very good idea to bring in someone with you. If you have to go to the doctor, <laughs> um, have someone there to take notes. It's a very stressful thing. So there, there are ways, you know, Rob, you have something on your, on your signature uh, of your email that I wrote down. I'm going to feed back to you. It's a quote from Buckminster Fuller. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete, which I love because it puts the responsibility back to the individual. Um, there are individuals who will build a better model, but the model for your own health care begins with, first of all, what is, what is your personal well-being depend on? Once you know what that is, then you, you can work toward it. Uh, I guarantee, because it's different for everyone. And how should someone dictate 
how many steps you want to take or, or how many pounds you want to weigh. This may vary, but this idea of personal well-being, I'm sure, will involve some amount of activity, some amount of enjoyable, fun activity, whether it's one of my favorites is yoga, it could be walking, it could be washing out your, the interior of your car. It's just getting your body in motion. And you know this releases all these pleasurable chemicals, your endorphins, and it doesn't take a lot of activity. That's where people have been misled. You don't have to be a marathon runner or go out there and punish yourself for an hour. 15 minutes, 30 minutes. The more you do it, the more you'll want to do it. But if you do it at a pace that is comfortable, you'll keep coming back to it. If you do it at a pace that is punishing and leaves you more fatigued, well, you're going to find a reason to quit. Yes. So, so that's, you know, that's part of personal well-being. And in terms of eating real food, you know, we are blessed in this country. We grow fabulous food. More people are growing food in pots in their backyard, community gardens are all over the country, not just in wealthy white neighborhoods. They're all over because people want this for themselves and they want it for their children. So at this point, they need to do it pretty much. They need to do a bottoms up <laughs> community effort and this is true also for making safe neighborhoods. You know, they've knocked PE out of school, which is tragic. And so it's up to us to give our kids safe places to play. Outside, you know, away from the video screens, green spaces do so much for kids. There's actually a, uh, there's a syndrome called nature deficit disorder. And it's actually quite serious that they see what happens. The children they, they wither when they're kept away from nature. And you put them in a natural setting, and they'll, they'll find out how to have fun. You don't have to organize, super organize their fun. Just let them have fun. So that's in bike lanes. I mean, again, you know, keep living in a community that supports safe places to play and move is so important. It's such a bottom up kind of thing. I haven't heard of uh, this nature deficit disorder. Can you talk a little bit more about that? It, it, sure. Uh, it, on the flip side, there's plenty of research that shows if you put people into nature, that, they, that there's all kinds of benefits from release of brain stimulating pleasure chemicals. They also have an enhanced sense of well-being. So, besides, so they may be working, if they've compared where people will do the same workout inside on a treadmill, inside a gym, and they do that same amount of effort outdoors, and there are more benefits doing it outdoors. So the pluses of being in nature are well, are well known, and now they're beginning to see that kids, and you know kids are in such trouble these days, high levels of obesity, depression, attention deficit disorders. Screen addiction. Pardon? Screen yeah. addiction. Yeah. So, so we can, so we know, so they actually have a diagnosis, nature deficit disorder. It's, it's, it's sad. It's sad, but it's all, it's all doable. You know, these are things that people can do for themselves and need to do, and I hope they have a good time doing it. Can you, can you describe some of the more about the nature deficit disorder. deficit disorder. You know what I would say to you to look it up, God, there's so much, you know, like what are the symptoms of it? I think that they, they see that kids, I'm gonna say in a general way, their well-being is enhanced. They, however, they're measuring that. And I, I'm not prepared with more details, but I'm for sure no nature deficit disorder is a real thing. This is why we have the Google. We ask the Google, yes. And they tell us. <laughs> well, you know, I've, uh, I've, I've long been very interested in what we have to learn from indigenous people. And one of the first things is connect with nature. Talk yes. to the trees. Be yes. one with nature. Get yes. out there and spend time there yes. every day. Have yes. plants in your life. I mean, it's, it, it doesn't have to take a lot of time, but it's something that is so essential to do. Absolutely. But now, you know, neuroscience is so refined now. They see the brain light up 
You know, they can, some people have been waiting for the science. I mean, I, I put the art and science of personal well-being in my title because there still are some people out there who don't understand the mind-body connection, even though it's well-established in, in every scientific way. It's not something they're taught. Once they experience it, maybe through martial arts or Tai Chi or Qigong or yoga or however, or just through any kind of meditation practice, once you, once you feel it, it you, oh, you do awaken to something and, you, and you, you always are looking for that connection. And it's very helpful in maintaining health. And I would say that what you're describing are approaches to learning how to be more in touch with yourself and more connected to your body and to increase your self-awareness. I think these are bottom-up ideas. I think that paying attention better, being more connected to your body, those are bottom-up approaches as opposed to being outside and spending all your time watching TV or just connected to the external world. You have to spend some time inward and you have to spend some time, if you, when, but we're also talking about nature, you want to spend some time connecting there. The top down way is this consumer culture that we have with all these, this media that, that is designed to addict you to pay attention to that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and we, you know, we've all fallen for it. I mean, I, we are, everyone I, you talk to, if they're connected to technology, they're too connected. They feel too tethered. Um, but I want to go back to a very good point you brought up. You know, again, as I, this book is based on my 40 years as a journalist. So I have the, I could look back and see trends that are fabulous, some of which I've mentioned, rise of organic food, uh, not just organic food, but real food, clean food. Um, but also when we, there's so much emphasis on big, on playing big sports, like play basketball, soccer, God forbid football, <laughs> but a lot of these big, you know, tennis. But what the science is showing us is that it's very, very important to go small inside the body, somatics training, to have a practice where you can sense your alignment and you know if your body is out of balance and you can feel, you can actually feel that your sacrum, for instance, is in balance. Because if you can tune into your body, as you've been saying, listen to it, have this, this dynamic conversation with your body, it will, you will prevent back pain. You will prevent all kinds of, of, of injuries that come from being out of balance because you'll have tuned in You'll, and you know what to do to realign. A lot, this is, um, the, it, the general term for this body awareness training is somatics training. And it's at the root of some, some, I think the most evolved yoga teachers are bringing this into their yoga. It's certainly part of Tai Chi, Qigong, which these are practices that anyone can do of any shape and size, small, measured, slow movements. And the benefits are fantastic. You know, it's funny, because uh, I've been playing racquetball for over 40 years. And uh, when I see newbies who are in a court, and you know, it's really obvious that they're just getting started, uh, I'll knock on the door and I'll say, you want a couple tips? And <laughs> I, I, t I tell them about my racquetball philosophy. And, Which is? And, and it's court sense and footwork. And court sense is basically figuring out where you want to be so that you can be in the position to hit the ball in, in the best way. Yes. Footwork is learning how to position yourself so that you, when you are in that position, you're optimizing your body so that you can hit the ball the best way. Yes. So, so what you're doing is you're playing smarter, not harder. I mean, that's kind of what the lingo would say. Absolutely. And it's very good. Are you also tuning into your body for your own health? Well, I'm not, I don't get into that with them. I mean, I, I mean my, my own personal background is I, I was involved 
in, with biofeedback for, for over 30 years, and I ran a couple conferences on it. So I'm very aware of the value of that. Right. But when I'm, when I'm giving tips on, I mean, but, but basically my tips are be conscious of, of what you're doing with your body and, and where you are doing it. And it's such yes. simple that yes. it really applies to everything. And it's great advice, but what I find, because I, 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 I'm, I've trained as a, I've been a certified fitness trainer for years and a coach, and I do this training to inform me as a journalist. And what I find though, that advice is fabulous. You then have to really, well, two things. First of all, people don't change because other people tell them to. This is one of the, this was one, this is one of the great shocking truths of behavior modification, let's say. You can ha have the best advice from the best coaches and trainers, but if you're not ready to change, really make a meaningful change, forget it. Don't waste your time. It's too stressful. You're not ready. If you are ready, then in something like, well, listen to your body, become more body aware. I think it needs an experiential training involved. Uh, you know, they can't just intellectualize it. They have to put themselves out there and learn from a good teacher and experience that felt connection to their body. It's so accessible, but people don't know it's there. I'm just saying. So I think it's uh, the next step is to, you know, you, you have, to have to choose your path. Yin yoga is a very good way to tune into your body. It's very slow. You don't have to really know how to do yoga. To do yin yoga, um, it, it, to begin with, and it's just a lot of... heard of yin yoga. What is it? Yin yoga is, it's, it's yoga. And you, when you go into a class, you're going to do maybe just five or six postures. So you're not going to do, you know, people think of yoga, going from posture to posture pretty quickly. And in this, you're going to get into a, a posture very, very often on the floor, a restorative posture. So you don't have to worry about your balance. You don't have to worry about falling over. You certainly don't have to worry about what the other people in the room look like. You're doing something, let's say, as simple as leaning over your legs. Now, it doesn't matter how far you go. That's not the point of it. It's the point of it is, are you, how does your body feel when you begin to lengthen your spine and move from your hips, not crunching or not going like this, but leaning forward like that? Well, your body has sensations when you do that. It will talk to you. And that's when the conversation begins. So if you're, if you're restricted from moving too far, that's okay. That's not a failure. That's feedback from your body. And that is the door that opens to people in something like yin yoga. Slow movements with a teacher who can keep you focused on what's going on inside your body. So you're not holding on to stress. You're creating space. And I know one, one teacher of mine says, okay, now I want you to float your kidneys. Float your kidneys. Now, you can, can you really float your kidneys? It mm, doesn't matter. But by imagining it, by visualizing it, you create micro movements within your body on an energetic level. Again, this is all scientifically out there. This is not the woo-woo of 50 years ago because now they know that the body moves at an energetic level. So- What do you um, mean by that, that the body moves at an energetic level? What does that mean? What does it mean? It means that you can affect the rhythms of your body, your heartbeat, your pulse, you can, you can you can create space in your spine, teeny amounts, by your posture, your alignment. Um, so by slow movements and visualization, you are able to affect, elongate, reduce stress on parts of, on your organs in your body. That's, that's, I mean, you know, your body is energy. You can take an EKG. You can measure your heartbeat. You can measure your brain waves. That's what they're measuring, these are expressions of energy in your body. Of course. Am I right? Okay. So we know that there is an energetic body. 
we didn't know so well, although the um, Eastern philosophies have known it for thousands of years, that through the power of your mind, you affect your physical body. You know, but there's, and these, um, you know, Candace Pert has done this book on molecules of emotion. I mean, this is, this is so well proven now. We're way be. I mean, there's thousands of, of studies proving this. I think it, when people talk about their health and well-being, though, I think we get caught up in the weeds too much. And, and for the average person, Rob, this is already boring. <laughs> you know what I mean? They study this, study that. I think they want practical, easy, pleasurable ways to feel better. And that's really you know? what you're doing in your book. You're, you, you, what's really nice about it is it's, it's, it's not an academic book. It's, it's a conversational kind of book where you really give people a feel for how they can ease into getting healthier, developing healthier habits, in so can I give, can I just say one of my favorites of my 40 years in this field that I just discovered a couple of years ago and I'm, and I'm targeting you, which is the benefits of a standing desk. There, there are, you know, I gotta say, I, I was reading that in your book, uh, getting ready for the interview and I have one. And okay. It is it in the box? <laughs> <laughs> it's piled up with papers and I'm going to crank it up, raise it up and, uh, <laughs> Get it back in use. Because, you know, what you're, there was, I think it's just recently in the New York Times, there's an article that sitting is the new cigarette smoking. That's where I was going with this. Yeah. There are 10,000 studies to show the dangers of sitting. Now, let me, I don't even understand why they go past 1,000. Right, I'll stand up too. Um, so we know sitting, it, it crunches your organs. It creates stagnation. It does, but whereas standing, and, and, and there's, you can't just stand without some consciousness because when you start standing to, let's say you're standing at your computer, it has to be, it should be ergonomically correct so that you're at a 90 degree, you know, your, your keyboard is at a 90 degree angle, your screen is, meeting your eye. I mean, there is a, there is a little bit of a science to it. But, and, but then when you're standing, you're not still, you know, you're, 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 you're moving your body, you're creating a flow of energy. And the most important thing is when you get tired, when you begin to feel fatigue, sit. Then you sit. Don't do anything to an extreme. Because after a while, your body is going to tell you, you know what, time to stand up again. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, that's a piece of advice that I give to a lot of the uh, younger guys uh, and women I play racquetball with. Because you know, I play a lot of racquetball. That's my main sport. Okay. And, you know, I, I, learned <laughs> uh, I'm, I still love to ski. And uh, you got to listen to your body. It's, it's when, when you don't listen to your body, that's when you get hurt. And, okay. Yes, I, like I listen to my body. Um, about di I given up downhill skiing for cross country. I listened after my second concussion. <coughs> Excuse me. But yes, it's how did you learn? Well, you said you were in biofeedback, so that's how you learn to listen. How do you? What do you advise for friends and your colleagues if they want to learn to listen? To listen to their body. No, you you got to pay it attention to little aches and soreness and tiredness. And if you've got a little tweak here and there that's, that, that wasn't there before, you know, that's a warning sign that you got to pay attention to. But I like what you're saying about doing it while working because uh, I, I need to start doing that more. I mean, I get out and, I, and I'm outside every day and uh, exercise every day for an hour or two. So I do that, but I'm sitting an awful lot. And, and I know... I, got, I really got into, at one point, learning about the lymph system. Now, the lymph system is your alternative circulatory system. Yes. It is pumped by muscles, actually. Exactly. That's exactly right. Now, it, the lymph system is, is where the, the, the gunk in your blood circulatory system goes. It kind of oozes out of the, out of the, the uh, your, 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 arteries and and it, it and it leaks into this lymph system and yeah. 
then we have lymph glands, uh, usually a lot of them under our arms, and, but th there's lymph spread throughout your whole body. And uh, the muscles movement are what squeeze it and keep it circulating and going. And that's how you get rid of a, a lot of toxins that are in your body. And if you're just sitting still, that lymph system is not working. So that's a real good reason as well. Absolutely. That is, that is certainly right. Um, and, and the benefits, another benefit of standing, besides the, you know, the idea of not sitting, you're so right, so punishing on the body. Um, I begged two nephews, well, one nephew of mine, to please, he's a lawyer, please get a, you know, even though people don't do what you tell them to do, I begged him to get a standing desk. He's a lawyer. So uh, f someone in his office got one, he finally got one, and it, he, his, his back pain was gone after about six months. And then he told his brother, and the same thing happened. Because when you're, well, for all the reasons we've, we've talked about, um, and, and it, as I say, you've got to, you know, make sure that you don't just stand static or, or overdo it. But, you know, when I travel now, I'm so addicted to my standing desk that um, I, whether I'm in a hotel or somewhere else, I get out an ironing board. Instead of putting my computer down at a low level where I have to sit, by taking out, a, a, this is crazy, but I do it. I take out their, their ironing board, raise it to the highest level. Good tip. That way I can stand up. It's not perfect because, you know, you're looking down at your screen, your arms aren't right, but it's a whole lot better than sitting. So this is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show on Pacifica Radio, Progressive Radio Network, at opednews.com slash podcasts, on iTunes, on Stitcher, and on YouTube as well. Look for my name, Rob Call, K-A-L-L. -L. My guest for this show is Marilyn Preston. That's at marilynpreston.com. She's a journalist, a healthy lifestyle expert, and an Emmy Award-winning TV producer. She's got a new book out, All Is Well. And uh, we've been talking, trying to take a bottom-up approach to health. Now, uh, and, and one of the, trying to, I'm trying to pull this together, really, because, uh, and, and so what I think is the, the top-down way to approach to health is let my doctor take care of it. Let the pills take care of it. Uh, I got my appointment every three months or every six months or once a year. I get a doctor's visit. That's like assuming that voting once every four years is going to take care of all the political stuff. Get it, getting your, depending on your doctor to be healthy is just about a death wish. It's, 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 it's a disaster, really, in terms of your personal responsibility. Now, I found out something very interesting. A while back, it's a good while back, it's probably about 10 or 11 years ago, I, I, I funded some polling uh, with the Zogby organization. And I asked a couple of questions because I was interested in, in people's perspectives on biofeedback and self-responsibility for health. And what I found out that really surprised me is that people who tend to be more conservative, libertarians, yes. they're more into taking responsibility for their health. And liberals are yes. more likely to do that authoritarian thing and do the, oh, doctor will take care of me. And that's a big mistake. Uh, the, the best thing you can do for, for yourself is take self-responsibility. Self-responsibility is as bottom-up as you can get in terms of your own personal health. But not, but not if it means cutting them off of medical insurance. Not if it means they're in a society. It's really a balance. you got to have a balance. You know, I, I'm, you know, I, I do a show on, on bottom-up, but we need top-down and we need bottom-up. Yeah, you need to have a doctor. Doctors are great particularly for emergencies and for big medical crises. But the way you keep out of those, the way you avoid medical crises is bottom-up approaches to health. Paying attention. Yes, yes I want to say, of course, that's true. But look, uh, thing, you know, things happen. People get sick. I mean, I, I've got this little cough you just, I had on display. Things happen. You can't escape it. But I want to shift the conversation to something you just said about the, the, it's the Republicans, let's say, or the, the people who we think are not in the progressive sector who believe so much in self-responsibility. It it, it, it's just not cutting people off and say, go get healthy. That's ridiculous. It's cruel. 
I think the, the model that, need, that will come from the bottom up, because changes in, I'll just say in the last 50 years, the biggest changes that I've seen in, in medicine have been consumer driven. That, you know, there's so many more people going to acupuncturists and eating differently and seeing their body workers because they know that a great massage can be much better for them than a, a pill that just kills the pain but does nothing to get to the root of the imbalance, the muscular imbalance. So that's why I think we have a fantastic opportunity now for the people who believe in responsibility, people caring for themselves, and the people who believe that all Americans, every single person should, should have health care as a right. If they got together and talked Amen. about a health care system that was designed for the patient, not for the insurance companies, but for the patient, we would explode the model into something that every other civilized country delivers right now, which is, I don't know what, you, I don't know what they're going to call it. They can call it Medicare for all. They can call it universal health care, national health service. But this, you know, this is what I see. We have the potential to make that move now. Do, do you agree? Absolutely. We, we, we not only have the potential, we have the responsibility. Yes. We, well, it's an embarrassment. It's, it's shameful that we don't have it right now. And uh, it's... But you think it, you see it, you've been tracking it for such a long time. Is it time for it to be named and moved on? Or do we still shrink from that? I think that we're, we're basically bought. You look at some of the biggest lobbyists and they're the hospitals and they're the chamber of commerce. And, you know, the, you know, companies keep people almost in a kind of slave state by when they are stuck with insurance through those companies. And they're afraid they're not going to be able to have insurance. And if they're sick or a family member is sick and they can't leave those jobs, they're stuck there. Even unions have where the unions have put together the deals so that the workers have health insurance. Some of them are opposing single payer because they'll lose some of their leverage. It's, it's a bad scene and it shouldn't be, it should never be. Every single person should not have to worry about it. And I know, I hear from people who travel and they go to other countries and they talk about how they're worried about what, to, what medicine they can afford. They worry about going to a doctor because they can't afford to pay for the, uh, the visit for a specialist or for an x-ray. And the, the people in these other countries, in Canada and in England and Germany and Italy and France and Japan and Every Korea, other oh, they all look at those people and they go, that's crazy. Yes. You don't and have that. See, and I think now that so many people have had a taste of what it is to, um, for some people, affordable health care, see their doctor, have some insurance, not only don't they want it taken away from them, but if you explain to these very same people, and again, I, I come at this as a journalist. It's not, I'm not as a Democrat or a Republican, but as someone who cares about the patient, my reader, the consumer of healthcare. Once you tell them that every other nation gets it free, they'll want it too. And then it's up to the top, the up top people to figure it out. Figure it out and give yourself three months because it's been around for decades in other countries. We, if the system were working, they could figure out a way to tweak it. But we have a system that isn't working. Everyone should be covered. And once, you, once that's, that's your mission, then everything else will fall into place. It's, right now the mission is, how do we sustain the profits of the insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just, it's a nice, I understand where it comes from and I, I love this country, but it's an inappropriate mission for healthcare. Healthcare is about treating people, patients, <laughs> and um, that's where the focus should be. Yeah. As, as we started out on care and connection and compassion. Would you like to read a uh, section, uh, an excerpt from your book? You feel like doing that? Yeah. I'll tell you what, I'll do another uh, station. So you look while I'm doing it, okay? 
Okay, sure, that's great. So here we go again. This is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com. Opednews.com is a progressive news and opinion site that basically gives you the, the take that you're not going to get on the mainstream. You're not going to get it on from liberal sites either. Op-Ed News is left of liberal. Uh, my guest tonight is Marilyn Preston. She's a journalist, a healthy lifestyle expert. She's the author of the book, All Is Well. She's got the longest running syndicated column on fitness. And, uh, oh, and uh, you can listen to this show on, on Pacifica Radio, on Progressive Radio Network, at opednews.com slash podcast, and at iTunes and Stitcher. So, Marilyn, you want to give us a, a, a read from the book? Thanks, Rob. I'll, I'll keep it short, but I think I have a good one here. Since we've spent so much time about this linking body and mind, it's so essential to everything that we'll follow in terms of your personal well-being. Okay. So I want to read, it's actually the first chapter in the book. Um, you always remember the first time. And my first time experiencing this sensational connection between mind and body happened the weekend I turned 30. It was an Aikido workshop led by the late and great co-founder of the human potential movement, George Leonard. Make your arms strong, he said. I stretched my right arm out, powered it up, squeezing as hard as I could until it was straight and strong. George pushed slightly and down it came like a child poking at a balloon. Whoa, what just happened? Then George suggested a visualization. Now release any tension and imagine you're sending a beam of light through your arm, past your fingers, beyond the wall, down the street. Ah, strength through relaxation. I was a woman of steel. It was a mind-blowing, life-changing experience. If I can do this, I remember thinking, what else is possible? So it's the gateway drug <laughs> to personal well-being to make that mind-body connection. And it's there waiting for you. It's the, it doesn't require a special skill. You do it at any shape and size. And um, it's a very much a bottom-up experience, I would say. Why? Why do you say it's a bottom-up experience? Because it's your body. It's not, and it's certainly not the body that we get fed in the advertisements and the images that, that are projected to us that make a lot of people feel like there's something wrong with their body. It's not thin enough. It's not this enough. Those images are a, a cruel representation. They're not reality. <laughs> and, they're, and they're beautiful. But anyway, so bottoms up because it's your relationship with this unique body you've been given. And... We're not, you know, we're not going to all of us be professional athletes or a size two or a guy with, uh, you know, buns of steel or whatever guys want from their bodies. But you have this body and you <laughs> bottom up from ground up, from, from the interior showing to the exterior. You have control of that. No matter what the cards you've been dealt, you may have, you may be sick, you might have real disabilities, but you work with the body you have and you bring it to the, to this, to the highest state you can. And then you feel good about it. And, you know, this thing about perfection, there's no, this, this Enzo, do, you, do we have a minute to I just want to mention one thing on the, the cover of the book is an Enzo, beautiful Zen circle by Kazuaki Tanahashi, who is a, Brilliant calligraphy, Zen master guy living in Berkeley. So this symbol, Kaz explains it in here. And I think it's so important for understanding. The Enzo contains the perfect and imperfect. That's why it's always complete. The perfect and the imperfect. And we are all imperfect. And that's just the reality of nature. And it's not a doomsday sentence. It's just our personal challenge. It's where are we on the path? Start where you are and move to the light, you know. So does that mean that I make it as a bottom-up concept? Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's like wabi-sabi too, kind of. Exactly, yes. And what is wabi-sabi? Tell us. Wabi, 
I basically think it's, it's like, okay, it's okay just the way it is. So it might be tarnished, it might have a dent. So what? You know, perfection, we, many of us suffer under the need to be perfect. Or we suffer because we know we are not perfect. And it's, um, it's, it's kind of a waste of time and very, this kind of negative thinking. You know, it's interesting. Not only is it depressing on the system, but they, back, in, back to the research, they say that people who are optimistic, they've shown that people who are positive about life are optimistic, live longer than those who aren't. And you know how much longer? Seven years longer. That's how important it is to have a positive attitude. And, and you know about happiness psychology. I mean, again, one of the gifts of the last few decades is we now know that people, if they're willing to cooperate and work with a therapist, can, can, take, can go from a negative state to a more positive state and move toward better health in the process. Yahoo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, what's interesting is um, I'm working... I'm, I'm I'm on deadline to finish my book for my contract. Uh, the the book is uh, bottom up, the connection revolution. And, and one of the people I interviewed, uh, Helena Norbert Hodge, did a documentary, uh, the economics of happiness. And in it, she talks a lot about uh, her experience with people in Ladakh, Tibet, and she was there maybe 30 years ago, and she got to know the people when it was a kind of a protected place, uh, really protected from the rest of the world. Absolutely. And, yeah. and then globalization came, and with it they got media exposure and television and roads that were built with subsidized money to bring in imported project products and she describes how the kids went from being really happy kids who all got along and they were all part of a community to wanting to have stuff like brand name sneakers yeah. and faces that looked like the white people in the TV and the movies that they saw. They literally wanted to have plastic surgery. And this is top-down kinds of thinking. This is thinking that comes from these centralized media that, and it's, a kind of, it's part of our consumer system. And, and, and that's, that's pathological. That is something that people have to learn. And it's something that kids should be taught in school, that you don't look at these actresses and actors, they're fake. And you don't want to be like them because you, uh, so many of them are ad addicted or alcoholic or they commit suicide. They're not happy people. They're just visages. They're, 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 just, they're, they're just not the real thing. The real thing is people who have flaws. People who are, what's the name of that circle again? The Zen circle, the Enzo. The Enzo. <laughs> The Enzo, <laughs> that again, both of them. <laughs> uh, if you're not watching the video, we both pull up the book at the same time. But, you know, the Enzo, the Wabi Sabi, that, that, is, that is what it is to be human. That it is, that's what it is to live in the world fully and completely with your flaws, accepting them from other people. And what's so interesting about the behavior, the research on behavior change is that if you get to if you can get to that place of self-acceptance and you accept yourself just the way you are the size you are flaws and all it's from that place of self self-efficacy and self-love that change can happen it's such a it's they've seen it time and time again you and 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 that's why um, if like people who set goals for themselves like say weight loss goals, you want to set a goal that is really small and doable that you're going to succeed at for sure. Not some crazy thing. I'll lose fifty pounds by <laughs> Thanksgiving. Let's say it. These are unrealistic, and all these diet magazines and diet books that promise. Yes, it's all part of of something that is counterproductive to well-being. But once you escape that, and it is escapable, and you have these little victories, and you have friends or family or 
anyone in your support circle who says, good job, yes, you can do it. And you begin to feel good about yourself. And don't, not worrying about the numbers on the scale, but how good are you feeling? How much pleasure are you having from this 10 minute walk? This is how change happens. And it's bottom up change. And that's what makes it lasting change. It's not change because you had a heart attack and your doctor said, you better start walking. I mean, that can produce change, I know, but it's the bottom up change. It's the change that comes from within that is long lasting, is sustainable, and enormously joyful. Enormously joyful. And so we've just that got a of life, huh? We've just got a couple of minutes left, and I wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit about your, the organization that you founded, Girls in the Game. Thank you. So kind. So I was a I was one of the founding members and the first chair of Girls in the Game. This was 22 years ago uh, in Chicago, and it's still thriving. It's 22 years later. We've served tens of thousands of girls in Chicago and now in Baltimore and Dallas. So we're spreading. And what we do is we 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 coach the girls in sports, healthy eating, leadership skills positive body image, conflict resolution, not to make them into superstar athletes, but to make them into the strong, healthy women that we need to lead this country <laughs> moving forward. You know, there are leaders in their communities. We, and every girl has that potential. Maybe not to run the you know hundred yard dash, but to, but to teach others, be a role model, be a leader. So I'm really proud of it. Thank you for mentioning it, Girls in the Day Game, Girls in the Game org, and we're on the internet, and we're just so happy for support. So think about it. <laughs> All right, uh, and Marilyn, your website is marilynpreston.com. That's M A R I L Y N N Preston. Ooh. Preston. Yes, and the book is on Amazon, all the good places. And um, Old Well, The Art and Science of Personal Well-Being. Yeah. You, people can check out your, your column on, on well-being at creators.com. Yes. And you've been listening to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show. The idea is we're shifting from a top down to a bottom up culture. And this is the show that explores it with experts and thought leaders on different aspects of it. You can check us out at iTunes, looking for my name, Rob Call, K-A-L-L. -L. You can hear us on Pacifica, on Progressive Radio Network, uh, at opednews.com slash podcasts, on Stitcher, and uh, on, soon gonna be going other places as well. Penny, it's been great to have you on the show. Really, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Your questions are fabulous. Very juicy conversation. Thank you. Well, and I strongly recommend the book, All Is Well. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not a preachy book. It's a book that you can pick up and put down a lot of short chapters, uh, summaries after each one. Uh, I, I, it's not the kind of book that I read every day, but it's not, I do, I mean, I, do, I just read nonfiction. I don't read fiction anymore, but it's an excellent book and I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Penny, for, for being on the show. And good luck with your book. I'm looking forward to reading it, Rob. Thank you. <laughs>